The Navajos say they uh, learned to weave from Spider Woman. This is a, a common belief all over the world. In the cold light of uh, museums, uh, we say that, that the Navajo probably made baskets and mats and things before they learned to weave on a true upright loom. And like so many other things uh, in, in Navajo culture, they probably learned many of these skills from the Pueblo people in the area. Perhaps during the uh, Pueblo Revolt of 1680 to 1692, when the Spanish were driven out of New Mexico, when the Spanish returned in 1692, many Pueblo people were afraid of uh, reprisals and went to live with the Navajo. And it's possibly at that time, I don't want to disparage Spider Woman, <laughs> but it's possibly at this time that the Navajos really took up weaving in a big way. By the mid-18th century, the Spanish uh, reports say they were the best weavers in the whole province, so they learned very quickly. And uh, if you've ever uh, seen Navajo young women learn to weave, indeed, their first uh, blanket may be very uh, poor, but by the second or third, they become excellent weavers. Because I guess in the Navajo way, you learn by watching the older people, and there are role models. And our blanket uh, is almost a whole blanket, and you can see when you look at it that it was cut very neatly with the scissors into two pieces. This was probably a, a money-making effort on the part of Mr. Day to sell uh, the pieces to different collectors, and they've been stitched against this background because the uh, piece is a little fragile and shows the early churro wool the earliest type of wool that the Navajo were using in their work, and a very simple design in stripes against a white background with the natural uh, brown wool right off the back of the sheep with no dye, and then a more subtle beige color arrived at by carding, that is, taking a dark brown and a white and uh, mixing it together with the carding combs. When I was a little girl and um, I was learning to weave meant a lot to me because it meant that I was learning to discipline myself. It was really an education for me. Your uh, motor skills and your mind and your, 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 all your thinking combined together and balancing out. And from that, you know, you produce something beautiful in designs and colors. The Navajo people um, constantly seeking, are seeking balance in their lives. It means that you can uh, function in harmony. And so when you sit down to weave, then you also think in your designs. Each little unit of your design is, is balanced, is symmetrical. So, you know, it has a middle, it has a center. So, and then the two sides are both equally the same. Then you go to your next unit and you balance that off the same way. And so you keep on going till all the way to the top of your weaving. I really do believe that the Navajo rugs are not, um, they're not just artistic ramifications of things. They're uh, actually a whole person, a balanced person, putting everything that she has within her, within her thinking, her, her ability, her uh, spirituality, all of those, uh, uh, even her emotions, all of those come into balance because in the Navajo way, they say, um, what they always tell you in Navajo, they say, which means make it beautiful. So you already have all of the, um, the qualities of the balance inside of you, and then all you need to do is project it onto your rug. Although Navajo don't have uh, chiefs, I think the term has some truth in it in that you would have to be a fairly well-to-do man or woman to afford one of these. Josiah Gregg in Commerce of the Prairies, an early account of the Santa Fe Trail, mentions a chief's blanket going for $50 in gold. Well, in the early part of the 19th century, $50 in gold is a great deal of money. He also mentions a Ute man trading one of his wives for one. The uh, Maxwell Museum is uh, fortunate in having one classic phase one cheese blanket. 
This is a very rare piece. There are only uh, a handful of them in uh, museums in the United States. The ch phase one cheese blanket is basically a uh, symphony of stripes, uh, uh, just a step beyond the massacre cave blanket with wide black and white stripes. The design focuses on the three bands of smaller stripes in the center and the top and bottom. And you'll notice that the blanket is wider than it is long. When uh, you visualize this on the back of someone, the uh, stripes would be right down the middle, across the middle of his back and shoulders. Phase two, which we think is roughly the same period as our phase one, shows a slight development in the uh, design. That is, notice the, the bars within the three main bands of design, which is why it's called a phase two, uh, that it's seen as a separate development, but they frequently overlap in time with a phase one. Well, un unfortunately, we can't allow museum visitors to touch pieces because uh, uh, so many people touching things over time would destroy, but there's something really wonderfully sensuous and tactile about uh, Navajo, early Navajo weaving. They're tightly woven, was made to be waterproof to protect the wearer from the elements. They've been through a lot. The colors change subtly over the years. Uh, collectors rave over the creamy ivory that this once pure white turns to. For some reason, you get these little uh, pieces of color, uh, this strand of indigo in the dark brown, and uh, little pieces of red just woven, and sometimes you even find pieces of the weaver's hair woven in. The way that they were made probably is, is in my mind, and w so when I see one, I just feel like, you know, they're very, very powerful. They, they almost feel, have like a feeling way out here, you're way standing away from the, the chief's blanket. It kind of like speaks to you and kind of shakes you. And you just really want to touch them because you want to get, you know, the, the blessing from it into your hands so, um, so that you could continue. To me, it just re-energizes and it gives you a lot of positive feeling, positive attitude, positive thinking. You also know you know that your grandmothers are in spirit with you. This is probably why this piece of rug feels that, that way to you, because uh, she may be around you, the one that made this rug. Perhaps the ultimate uh, phase of a cheese blanket is phase three. It's a rather sudden uh, shift in pattern from stripes and arrangements within the stripes to a, a large uh, central diamond superimposed on the stripes. Notice that the uh, diamond in the center is a full one, and the corners have quarter diamonds and the sides half diamonds. Traders like to mention the fact that uh, when they're folded, the quarter diamonds and the half diamonds make a whole one in the center. Although, of course, it's uh, unlikely that any Navajo would have folded or used it in that way. In fact, again, it'd be worn around the shoulders of a man or woman with a large diamond right in the center of the back and the others uh, more or less meeting in, in the center of the uh, person's chest. Uh, notice also the uh, step design uh, on the uh, edge of the diamonds. This is a very fine little terrace which about this time or a little later, the 1860s and 70s, goes from a, a small step or terrace to a large serrate design, possibly as a result of uh, influence from uh, saltillo or Mexican weaving that includes not only this uh, large serrated design, but the fact that there's a central motif and uh, a small border around it. Uh, leads us to the, to the next period, which is really a transitional between a time when weaving was strictly worn to rugs that are used on the floor. Well, historians consider everything made before roughly 1880 to be the classic period and everything after, post-classic or eye dazzler or transitional. Uh, it, it's easier to, to look at an eye dazzler than it is to explain it. Uh, the colors uh, are at a real explosion. And it is really as a result of the increased trade goods that came into the Southwest as a result of the railroad coming through. And they 
were liberated from the limited color palette they had uh, previously, they had all these wonderful colors that they hadn't been available to them before, so they just went wild with them. The one we've chosen here uh, is a especially fine example because each design element is outlined with uh, a narrow strip of another color, which adds to this vibrating, pulsing quality of a, of a true eye dazzler. There are many pieces of the classic period that resemble eye dazzlers, especially if you get one that hasn't faded, it's had uh, a good history of, of care, and uh, you get things that are uh, like this one that are really incredible, bright red, the whole background is red. You can make a case for this being an eye dazzler. It's really as if these design elements, which are quite similar to the cheese blanket, I don't want to give the impression that the cheese blanket was the um, major ex uh, artistic expression. They are rather rare and blankets of this size and uh, design are far more common, if we can say common. There are two important historical occurrences in the last half of the 19th century that are of great importance for Navajo weaving. One was the signing of a peace treaty in 1868, which secured to the Navajo federally guaranteed reservation lands. As part of this peace treaty, uh, the Navajo were allowed to invite traders licensed by the federal government and trade with them so that uh, instead of trading uh, their blankets with the youths, the uh, Cheyenne and the, and the pl other Plains Indians, but they're uh, weaving for a new tribe, if you will, the tribe of Anglo tourists who are coming through who want to buy a souvenir of their visit to the Southwest to uh, decorate their homes. The need now was not for a wearing blanket, but for a rug uh, for the homes of these people who were going to take them to California and the Midwest and the East.